Welcome to this YSL tutorial. In this session we're going to teach you all about using variables in Microsoft SQL Server. What we'll cover in this session is first of all the basics of using variables. We'll start with an explanation of what variables actually are, then show you the three main things you'll need to be able to do when working with variables. That's declaring them, assigning a value to them, and then referring back to that value later on usually in a query. Once we've covered the basics, we'll move on and show you some more specific uses for variables in SQL Server. How you can store the results of a query in a variable, and then how you can display the values that you've stored in variables using either print or select statements. We'll show you how you can read a single record into a set of variables, and also how you can accumulate values in variables as well. And then finally, to finish, we'll introduce you to the idea of global variables and some of the useful pieces of system information that you can retrieve. So let's get started. A variable is simply a space in memory where you can hold a single piece of information while your procedure runs. They're useful whenever you want to give your procedures a memory, if you'd like to be able to refer to the same value from one statement to the next within a procedure, a variable is usually the way to go. So here's a small example which demonstrates how variables work. What well, we have are three separate select statements joined together in a union query. Each select statement selects three different bits of information from separate tables, and each query, each select statement uses a WHERE clause um, testing for a specific date. And the same date is using all three select statements. And the query works happily. If I execute it, I'll see a set of results. I get a combination of uh, directors and actors and films from separate tables. But what would happen if I wanted to change the date that I'm using? At this point, I'd have to change it in three separate places. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a variable which will store the date that we want to use and then refer to that variable in each of our WHERE clauses. The first step in using a variable is to declare it. And I'm going to do that at the top of my procedure after my use and go statements. I'm going to give myself a couple of blank lines and then begin a single line with the word declare. If you're familiar with other programming languages such as Visual Basic, you may be familiar with using uh, the word dim to declare your variables. It's exactly the same idea in SQL Server. The next thing you must do is think of a sensible name for your variable, and bear in mind that all variable names in SQL Server begin with an at symbol. Um, I'll think of a sensible name, it's kind of a boring name, but there we go, at my date, and that's going to be the name of the variable that I'm going to use. And then finally, I can assign a data type to the variable. Now I know that the kind of data I want to store in this variable is date and time information, so I'm simply going to write after the name of the variable uh, the data type date time. Just a quick note for people who are more familiar with, uh, with Visual Basic or Visual Basic for applications, you can also optionally add the as keyword when you declare your variables. It is genuinely completely optional in SQL Server. Um, my recommendation would be to pick one method, either do or don't use it, pick that method very early on and then stick to it. Once you've declared a variable, the next step is to store a value inside it. So to make that work, we're going to add a couple of blank lines again, and to set the value of a variable, you begin a line with the word set. You can then type in the name of the variable you want to set the value of, or assign a value to, and follow that with an equal sign, and then the value you would like to store in it. So I'm going to use the same date that I've previously used, so 1970-01-01. So that's setting the value of a variable. It's very, very straightforward. The, hopefully it's fairly obvious that the data type you pass into the variable must be the same as the data type you used when you declared it. But other than that, it's very straightforward. The final step in this example is to use our variable to replace the individual dates that we've used in each of the WHERE clauses. And that, hopefully, again, is as straightforward as you'd expect. I'm going to copy the name of my variable here rather than type it in several times. And instead of using the, uh, the, the explicit date 1970, I'm going to replace that with my variable's name. If I do that three times, I can then simply run this query or this uh, procedure in exactly the same way as I did before. And I'll get at this point exactly the same set of results, everything from 1970. The beauty of this example though now is that if I simply modify a single value in my variable assignment statement, when I execute the, the procedure again, 
I'll find a completely different set of results. So hopefully that demonstrates how useful variables can be to speed up the way you write, um, write certain procedures. So far we've seen that we can assign an explicit value to a variable using a set statement like this one. What I'd like to do next is show you that you can also set the value of a variable using the result of a select statement. So imagine that as well as wanting to see the list of results in the, uh, the results panel, I'd also like to see a breakdown of how many films, actors and directors there are within my set of results. In order to make that work, I'm going to declare, um, let's start with just declaring um, a single variable which allows me to count the number of films. So I'm going to declare a variable called uh, at num films, and the data type of this one, I'm going to use the, uh, the int data type. Now, instead of using a, a set statement like the one that I use for my date, I'm not going to set the, uh, the variable to be an explicit value. What I'm going to do instead is set at num films equal to the result of a select statement. If I want to do this, I need to make sure I enclose the select statement in a set of parentheses or round brackets. And then all I need to do is write out the select statement that would generate the count of the number of films from the film table where the film release date is greater than or equal to the my date variable. So it's almost exactly the same select statement as I used in the first place to generate the list of results. But instead of actually selecting the, uh, the column names, I'm selecting a count of all the, the records from that table. I've just quickly declared two new variables, num actors and num directors, and I've set their values using the same technique as we use for the number of films. What I need to do now is work out where I can display those values once my procedure is finished running. I've got a couple of different choices. One thing that I could do, if I give myself a couple of blank lines uh, just below my uh, set statements, I can simply select the results of my variables into the, uh, the results panel again. So let's show you quickly how you can do that. You can simply say select, actually I want to display a bit of text as well, so I'm going to display a number of films, uh, comma, at num films. If I execute this entire page now, I'm going to end up with two separate result sets. So if I execute, there we go, I can see that I get the original set of results showing me all the films, actors and directors, and then my extra uh, result set showing me that number. To continue in that vein, all I'd need to do is add a union keyword and then say select, let's say number of, excuse me, can't type number, there we go, number of actors, and then another comma, and then the at num actors variable. And if I execute the query again, I'll add to my little set of results. So that's one place that you can show the information um, from a variable, you can select it into the results panel. There is one other place that you can display the results of your variables as well, and that's on the messages tab using a print statement. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take away, I'm going to in fact replace the word select with the word print here instead. And then just for the moment, I'm going to take away the, uh, the bit of text, number of films. I don't need the union keyword. And again, I'm going to replace all of this with the word print. So what's going to happen in this case when I execute my query is that I don't see an extra result set in the results panel, but if I head onto the messages tab, I see the values of my variables printed. Now it'd be nicer if I could display that in sort of a, a full sentence, so number of films equals 239. I have to be quite careful about data types when I do this. If I try to tag on that piece of text at the beginning, a number of films, sorry, beg pardon, a number of films equals, and then I try to concatenate in the, uh, the number of films variable with a plus symbol. When I try to execute the query, I'm going to end up with a, with a conversion error. Whenever you try to build a sentence, whenever you try to concatenate values in a SQL Server, you must ensure that all the values as part of the sentence are bits of text. And I'm trying to, to add a number to a bit of text. What a SQL Server does in that case is it tries to perform an arithmetic um, addition. It tries to add the word number of films to the value 239. 
so it's pretty confusing. What we're going to do here is simply apply a cast or convert function to convert the number of films variable into uh, some kind of text. I'm going to go with varchar max for this particular short example. So if I execute the query this time, I ought to end up on the messages tab with a slightly more sensible message. So I've just quickly added in an extra couple of print statements and concatenated a sensible message so that we can see the full set of outputs on the messages tab. I wanted to make a quick mention, however, of this extra output at the bottom, the row count, which always appears when you execute statements in SQL Server on the Messages tab. Um, this row count is actually associated with a union query that we run uh, after we've printed out all the results of all of our variables. So this entire union query, this entire effectively single select statement, has affected 259 records. Now, sometimes if you're presenting messages on the Messages tab, so customized messages, you don't want the row count message to appear. So it's actually possible to suppress that with a simple statement. If I add this to the top of my procedure, I can simply write set no count on. And when I execute this procedure again now, I'll find that the row count message has disappeared. So we've seen now that you can assign values to variables in one of two ways, either by assigning an explicit value in the set statement like this, or by setting it to the result of a select statement using an aggregate function, count, min, max, sum, etc. What I'd like to do now is move on and show you that you can set the value of a variable in the select list of a select statement. So here we've got a basic query which selects a single record, a single actor, from the actor table where the date of birth is after a specific date. We've ordered the results in a specific order and what I'm going to do is I want to read in the results of these three fields into three separate variables. So to make this work, I need to declare three separate variables at the top of my, uh, my procedure, declare at. I'm going to call them simply id, which will be an integer, and I'm going to declare at name, which will be varchar, I'm going to give a max, and then I can declare at date, which will again be date and time data. So the next job is to assign values to each of these variables, and I'm going to do that, as I said, in the select list itself. So I'm effectively selecting a record into variables. To make that work, it's fairly straightforward. All I need to do is say the name of the variable is equal to that field. And likewise, I can say then at name equals at name, and subsequently at date equals at a date of birth. If I execute the query now, one thing that you'll notice is that I don't see this set of results. I don't actually see a results panel. All I get is a message saying that my command has been completed successfully. So when you do this, you actually don't select the set of records into the results panel. All the data has simply been used to, be, uh, to assign the values of these variables. So again, if I actually want to make use of the values of those variables, I either have to display them somewhere, so I could write another SELECT statement here, which will select the uh, name variable and the uh, date variable, so I should be the actor's name and date of birth. And then I've actually sneakily already written another query, which makes use of the third variable. So below here, I have another SELECT statement, which selects the name of a film and a character name um, from a combination of tables where the cast actor ID is equal to the value of my ID variable. So I'll get two separate sets of results now when I run this query or execute this, uh, this procedure. If I execute the whole thing, I'll end up with two separate result sets. One showing me the actor's name and date of birth, and then finally a list of all of the films and all the roles that that character played. Following on from selecting a record into separate variables, it's also possible to accumulate values in a variable within a select statement. So what I have here is a simple variable uh, called name list, which allows me to store varchar data. And I'm writing a single simple select statement, which selects the actor's name from the table in a particular year. What we're going to do is we're going to accumulate a list of the actor's names in this variable. So we'll create a comma separated list to begin with. To make this work, I need to make sure that I've initialized my variable. So I'm going to set at name list equal to uh, an empty string to begin with. 
This technique relies on the fact that the variable has some sort of value already that is not null. Now all I need to do is modify my select list so that instead of just um, selecting the list of actors names, I'm actually setting the value of my name list variable as well. So I'm going to say at name list is equal to. And then what I'm going to do is I want to make sure that I add my value on each actor's name is added onto the end of the current list of names. So I'm going to make name list equal to what's already in the name list variable plus the actor's name plus a comma and a space at the end. All I need to do now is right at the very bottom of my procedure is to show that information somewhere. I'm going to print at name list so it will come out on the messages tab. Let's get that properly written in there uh, at name list. And if I execute this query now, I'll see on the messages tab a list of all the actors who were born in the year that I've asked for. One other useful thing you can do here, uh, when particularly when you're working with text, is rather than separating each value with a comma or, or some other character, you can actually insert uh, line breaks or line feeds. You can do that using the char function. Um, there are two characters you can use here, char10, which is the carriage return, I believe, and there's also char13, which is the, uh, the line feed character. Um, if I execute this query now, I'm going to end up, rather than all my values on a single line, I'm going to end up with um, about blank lines between each one. I suspect that if I take away one of these characters, if I just include char10, uh, that will actually give me each line, each, each value on a separate single line. So it's, it's not the most useful thing you'll learn in the world, it's not the most common thing you'll do, but it's useful to know how you can do that should you need to. So we've talked about how you can declare your own variables, assign values to them, and then retrieve those values. What I'd like to do to finish off this video is just show you a few of the built-in global variables or system variables. There may be some useful bits of information you can find here. Um, I'm going to use the select uh, statement rather than the print statement here, just because it helps me with the IntelliSense list. If you try to type in a couple of at symbols when you're selecting, you'll find you get a long list of what I refer to as global variables. And these are built-in system bits of information. So useful bits of information you can find here, for example, the server name. So if I execute this simple statement here, it shows me the name of the server that I'm currently working on. And there are several other bits of useful information you can find with the global variables as well. So for example, as well as displaying the server name, I can also select the version of SQL Server that I'm working on. If I execute this, uh, I need a slightly wider column to display all the information. There we go. It's all very useful stuff, I'm sure. Uh, what other things can we do? Um, there's a, a global variable called atat row count, which if you remember earlier on, we suppressed the, uh, the row count um, when we wrote our slightly longer procedure. It did. It, it, turned off the, uh, the count of the number of records affected. Um, but if I did something very quick and simple, like select everything from uh, the actor table, for example, my, uh, my row count, selecting the row count, will, uh, will actually show me the number of records affected by the last statement. It should be exactly the same number as is displayed here on the messages tab, in fact. But if you suppress the row count or you wanted to pick up on the number of records you've uh, selected or deleted or, or modified, then the, the row count variable can be quite useful as well. It can be worthwhile investigating a few of these, um, few of these global variables to see what sort of information you can retrieve. But I thought it was a nice way to finish off our video on variables. If you've enjoyed this training video, you can find many more online training resources at www.wiseowl.co.uk.